everyone, my name is Holly Kearns and I'm the Learning and Public Engagement Curator at the Butler Gallery. Uh, I'd like to welcome this evening Daniel Iotis, Commandant Daniel Iotis from the Irish Defence Forces and from the Military Archives, who's going to give a final uh, talk in our talk series in association with Amelia Steen's exhibition, The Bloods, which documents members of the Irish Defence Forces in all of the varied roles. This uh, event tonight has an exclusive uh, online audience as it's being live streamed from the St. Canis's Credit Union uh, Learning Centre here at Butler Gallery. And the title of the talk this evening is an overview of the development of the military archives 1924 to present. So I'm really glad that you're here, Daniel, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank Great you. Great to be here. Thanks very much, Holly. Okay, before we begin, I'd like to start with a video which is a, a succinct two minute introduction to where the military archives is now and, uh, and then the aim of the presentation over the next 35 to 40 minutes is to describe how we got to this place over the course of the last 96 years. So I'll start off with the video. The military archives hold some of the most valuable records that we have as a state, largely dealing with events from, I suppose, the foundation of the volunteers in 1913 uh, up to last week. And part of the capital programme for the government for this decade of centenaries was to build a new building for the military archives. And hey presto, here it is. There's a number of benefits for the for the visitor. Obviously, that you have a, a very attractive building, but you also have uh, additional comfort. We have more than double the research room size, so I mean we can now take double uh, the number of researchers, and we also have a significant lowering in retrieval time. The records of the Irish Revolution are amazing. They're quite unlike any collection in any other country that I know of. They're amazing in their depth, in their breadth in what they tell us not only about uh, the independence struggle and the Irish military, but about the lives of those uh, who fought and died, about the lives of those who fought and survived, about Irish society generally. They're absolutely extraordinary. It means that we have made secure the story uh, of our past, but also that we have left it open uh, to further contributions. So it will just grow and grow and I think future generations will be very grateful for it. It's a great, great credit to those who made it possible. Okay, so that's where we are now. And before I begin, I'd just like to make people aware that this is a whistle-stop tour of an institution with a very rich history, both within the Defence Forces and within Irish archival institutions. The last talk I gave on the history of the military archives covered the first 10 years and lasted just over an hour. Um, so yeah, just be aware, this is a whistle-stop tour of a very rich history. So the military archives itself is positioned within the Chief of Staff's Division of the Defence Forces. And this means that it is situated at the highest tier of administration and accountability. And this is as it should be, as the role of an archives within modern democracy is as an agent of accountability of the state and advocacy for the people of that state through the, through the provision of public ac access to the, to the decision-making processes of government. Now, the military archives' origins lie within the Army's intelligence branch back as far as 1924, where it remained until being remo moved to public relations branch in 2012. The military archives is what's known as a place of deposit under the terms of the National Archives of Ireland Act 1986, now this is a statutory responsibility designated by the Taoiseach, Mr. Charles Hawhey, in 1990. And this means that the archives is the official state repository for all archival records of the Army, Naval Service, Air Corps, Department of Defence and Army Pensions Board. The precursor of the Air, uh, Army's early archival efforts can be traced to the activities of Commandant General Pierce Beasley, who, along with Captain J.J. Bourke, acquired and managed records during the Civil War years. 
In June 1923, Beasley wrote to the Chief of Staff requesting that he treat the work on which Captain Burke and I are engaged as a temporary Department of Army work under some such title as, Army, as War Records. What we are really doing is collecting material and records which would be of great value for reference as a complete history of the Irish Volunteers, IRA and the starting of the regular army, as well as the Anglo-Irish and Irregular Wars. Now, unfortunately, Beasley was informed by the Chief of Staff that his suggestion could hardly be entertained, as the army was in the process of reducing its size post-Civil War. In those circumstances, the proposal to create a new department, Beasley was told, could scarcely be urged. While Beasley's request to the Chief of Staff for the establishment of a War Records Office was unsuccessful, there still existed a requirement for such a facility within the organisation. So in February of 1924, the Army's Director of Intelligence, Colonel M.J. Costello, wrote to the Chief of Staff on the subject of the organisation of his intelligence branch staff. And in his letter, he raised the pressing necessity for the investigation of persons claiming under the Army Pensions Bill in respect of people killed during the period 1916 to 1921 and recommending that the responsibility for the investigation of these and other matters usually referred to intelligence for inquiries should be fixed. So there are two important points here. The first is that from the very foundation of the army, there was a requirement for a section to organize and retain documents of an evidential and archival nature. And second, we see that the initial driving force behind this is investigating claims made under the Army Pensions and Military Service Pensions Act for service during the independent struggle. Many decades later, of course, in the present day, as anyone who is familiar with the military archives collections will know, the Military Service Pensions Collection is our largest single collection and the country's most important source of documentary evidence on the revolutionary period. And significantly, early records contain several prescient references from staff at the military archives to the future potential of these pension applications to become the most valuable source on the 1913 to 1921 period. So in December of 1924, Costello wrote to the Chief of Staff this letter entitled Historical Documents and the Formation of Military Archives. In this, we see for the first time that the establishment of the military archives is formally proposed, which makes it an important document. As Costello's staff had been compiling and collecting important historical military records and so proposed the establishment of a section to gather all such material. Now, these records were at the time under the charge of a civilian clerk named Thomas Galvin, and Galvin's duties included maintaining a newspaper archive and dealing with internal requests for historical data, particularly, again, in support of claims made under the 1924 Military Service Pensions Act. Now, the documents under Galvin's charge at that time included old records from the Royal Hospital Comenum that had belonged to the British administration and comprised the correspondence and papers of the Commanders-in-Chief of the Forces in Ireland, 1784 to 1894, also known as the Kilmainham Papers for short. Now, these records were discovered discarded in a cellar in the main building of Army General Headquarters. They were removed to the office in room number 40 and then placed under Galvin's charge. And Galvin was attached to operations branch at that stage. The second lot of material available in the archives at that time consisted of approximately 7,000 intelligence records from the Civil War period. Now, these re these re referred to a range of subjects, including the National Army, the Irregular Forces and their activities, the IRAO, Labour and Communist activities, and Irish organisations abroad, as well as operational reports. In response to Costello's request, the Chief of Staff approved the establishment of a military archives under the control of Captain A. Blake and assisted by Mr. Thomas Galvin. On the 5th of January 1925, the Comanian papers were transferred from Operations Branch to the archives. This, however, was something of an ad hoc arrangement and the physical accommodation provided for these important records was still entirely unsuited to anything of an ambitious nature and needed to be addressed. So, on the 11th of February 1925, Costello directed Galvin to draft a proposed formal establishment for the military archives and one week later Galvin presented it to Costello and this is the front cover of that document which we hold at the military archives. Now this is an incredibly significant document regarding the origins of the military archives and it's one of my personal favourites within our whole collections. The objectives described in the 1925 draft proposed establishment which aimed to put a formal structure 
and what had been operating on a more ad hoc basis since 1924 are as recognizable to us as archivists now as they were back then. It is important to note also at this stage that while the Chief of Staff had given permission for its establishment, the military archives did not have official sanction as a national institution from the Minister for Defence or Government. So this document was also part of making this case and strengthening it. Galvin's ambitious report identified seven potential sources of material for the military archives. And one of these was the Castle Papers, specifically the military papers in Dublin Castle dating back to the time of Queen Elizabeth. Now, Galvin identified the value of holding these papers as complementary to the Khamenei papers, noting in one document that the Royal Hospital papers largely consist of the correspondence of the Commander-in-Chief with the castle. The replies or corresponding communications ought to lie in the castle. And I think this is a, an indicator of Galvin's acumen as an archivist, even though he wasn't um, formally trained or experienced as one. Now, the Castle Papers were under the custody of a man named Mr. Thomas Markham, who had been one of Michael Collins' spies in Dublin Castle during the War of Independence. At the time that the Provisional Government took over Dublin Castle, Markham had been appointed by Collins to a position very vaguely entitled Civil Officer in Charge. The eccentric Markham, however, developed grossly exaggerated notions of his role, claiming that Collins had entrusted him with the custody of all state papers. Now, with the death of Collins, his claims about his actual responsibilities and those entrusted uh, to him by Collins became impossible to categorically confirm or refute. And by 1924, documents record that Markham was becoming increasingly unstable and become a hindrance to the efficiency of the government. And the decision was made that he was to be removed from the castle. The following year, the eagerly sought castle papers were removed from Markham's care and ended up not in the military archives, but in the custody of the Ministry of Finance in a dramatic episode when officials from the Ministry of Finance, accompanied by officials from the Board of Works, had to force entry, occupy Markham's offices and change the locks. This 1925 letter from Commandant Brennan Whitmore of the Intelligence Branch gives some indication of the thinking behind the desire for the military archives to obtain the military papers in the castle. In this letter, Brennan Whitmore recommends to Costello that documents inherited from the British, which were of specific military value, should be taken over by the Ministry, for Def Ministry of Defence and transferred under the authority of the Minister to the military archives in order to inform Irish defence policy. His reason being that many of the issues that faced the Irish Army had been encountered by the British Army in Ireland in the past. Now, just as the government of the time never authorised the transfer of the Castle Papers to the military archives, they continued to refuse to officially sanction the establishment of the military archives despite repeated appeals by the Chief of Staff. Perhaps this is not surprising. 1924, for example, had seen the army crisis, and there were still ripples um, from that, and it was still, the, the effect was felt very strongly. Irish policy of access to state records as well, from independence, until the 1970s, have been described as one of a combination of rigid control over access and willful neglect. The reason for this being an attempt to confine the interpretation of the past, particularly the recent past, to the perception advanced by the Republican revolutionary generation. And that is something put forward by um, Professor Gerard O'Brien in this book, Irish Government and the Guardianship of Historical Records, 1922 to 72. Now, the idea of using archives to control the interpretation of the past was not atypical of the archival methodology of the time, and brings us on to another interesting episode from the early records of the military archives, where uh, army intelligence were investigating an anti-treaty counter-archive that was apparently in the process of being created by Eamon de Valera. One example is this intelligence report concerning the raid on the home of Piers Beasley to procure by force documents to be used in the publishing of his book, which it was believed would damage the irregular cause. As I'm sure many people know, Beasley wrote a, a biography of Michael Collins, amongst other things. Now, this letter, written to Commodore Brennan Whitmore by Mr. Thomas Galvin, demonstrates the extent of these efforts, with its reference to an unimpeachable source, secret channels, and a furtive mission to England to retrieve documents concerning the treaty negotiations from the Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald. It's evident from the fact that he had produced intelligence reports such as this, as well as the draft establishment of the military archives, 
that the greatest legacy, perhaps, of the very earliest years of the military archives may well belong to Thomas Galvin. However, Galvin left his position in the army in 1926, being called to the bar. His departure further exacerbated the ad hoc nature of the military archives, leaving the chief of staff in a position in 1926 where he was reporting to the Minister for Defence that there was no suitable man to whom such important work could be entrusted. As a result, the work of the military archives effectively ceased until 1929. To their credit, reports from this period demonstrate that successive directors of intelligence, as Collins uh, Costello had left intelligence to join the military mission to the USA in 26, continued to advocate for the archives section, even if it was with very limited results. So in 1929, Colonel J.J. Ginger O'Connell, who, like Beasley, had also been an IRA GHQ member during the War of Independence, took over as Director of Intelligence, and things started to seem a bit more positive for the military archives. In 1929, uh, O'Connell wrote to the Chief of reported to the Chief of Staff that a commencement was made in the matter of archives. And by 1930, O'Connell was reporting to the Chief of Staff that a considerable amount of progress has been made with reference to military archives and that measures are in preparation with a view to assembling material for a properly authoritative official history of the War of Independence. Now, things were far from perfect, though. On the 1st of July, 1930, O'Connell wrote to the Chief of Staff, uh, confirming that his staff were not in a position to verify pre-true service for the purpose of processing military service pensions applications, stating that, we have no records of the pre-truce period and cannot verify the service of any man who claims to have served in the IRA. A regrettable admission, but unfortunately true. O'Connell also informed him that his department was not permitted to extend their research outside of official circles and had not received official sanction or encouragement to actively acquire, acquire material connected to the pre-truce period. O'Connell's progress with the military archives was interrupted when he proceeded on the staff officer's course at the military college on the 23rd of February 1931 and was temporarily, temporarily replaced by Commandant Dan Bryan as acting director of the Second Bureau. Upon his return in late 1931, O'Connell found a Second Bureau that had laboured under considerable difficulties in his absence, as Bryan had as Brian had, had to uh, devote a considerable amount of time and attention to other army obligations. The work of the archives was further frustrated and slowed up during this year by the absence of staff officer Captain Niall Harrington on a course at the military college. O'Connell was then replaced as the director of the second bureau in March 1932 by Colonel Liam Archer, being posted to a new appointment as the officer in charge of the Army Equitation School. Now, one of the first tasks overseen by Archer marks a dark period in the history of Irish archives this being in response to the, to the destruction order authorised by Desmond Fitzgerald, the Cumann and Ale Minister for Defence, on the 7th of March, 1932. Now, this order direct, directed the destruction by fire of Civil War records, namely intelligence reports, including reports and particulars supplied by agents and other persons, secret service vouchers, etc., proceedings of military courts, and reports on and details of executions. The reason for this destruction order was that such documents contained information which could lead to loss of life if disclosed to unauthorised persons, and was given in the wake of the imminent handover of power to their previous Civil War opponents in Fianna Fáil. Now, while Fitzgerald Order said that prior to destroying these records, they were to extract such particulars as may be considered or required afterwards in the conduct of the business of the Department of Defence, Archer noted that as a consequence of their destruction, surviving files and documents required a complete overhaul. It is unclear how much material was lost during the destruction order as Archer's staff did not succeed in uh, completing an inventory as they had admirably endeavoured to do before the order came into effect. So between 1933 and 1934, this man, Colonel E.V. O'Carroll, was the acting director of the Second Bureau. And during his tenure, the archive section became known as the historical section. Now, this reflected the orientation of the section towards actively acquiring and compiling a history of the revolutionary period from those identified as reliable sources, no doubt at least partly influenced by the requirement to verify pre-true service in relation to pension applications. It was during his tenure 
that the Anglo-Irish Conflict 1913 to 1923 project came about at a time where there was a growing awareness within political circles, particularly amongst Fianna Fáil, who had recently taken power, as I mentioned, of the need to document the Irish Revolutionary Period. It was in some ways a precursor to the Bureau of Military History in the 1940s and 50s, the, origin of, the origins of which in fact date back to that same year of 1933, when the Minister for Education, Thomas Derrick, suggested to the Department of Defence initiating a project to collect and preserve the records of the War of Independence. Now, O'Carroll was assisted on this project by Captain Niall Charles Harrington, who I mentioned a few slides back. And he was responsible for the correspondence with those identified as potential sources of testimony for the Anglo-Irish uh, conflict project. Harrington worked enthusiastically on soliciting accounts, but by 1935, it was becoming clear that despite the support of the Chief of Staff of the project, the Anglo-Irish conflict project was not going to achieve the success that O'Carroll and Harrington had, attend, had attend, intended. Quite possibly, many people were still too close to the events to be willing to participate. So in 1935, Colonel Lee Marcher was appointed as the Director of Intelligence. And this was an important year for the military archives. It was the year that the military archives became officially a part of the Army's establishment, of the Defence Forces establishment. And this, of course, required the appointment of an officer in charge. And this appointment was given to Colonel J.J. Ginger O'Connell. But the most significant growth of the in the archives took place during O'Connell's time as officer in charge. The archives moved to Griffith Barracks, and correspondence from this time record his constant advocacy and agitation for more staff and better equipment. O'Connell proactively, proactively sought out collections for the archives from both internal and external sources, and his popularity and personal charm gained many external advocates and positive relationships with other, with other people within the Irish cultural and heritage fields for the archives. In 1939, and the beginning of the Second World War, was the beginning of the end for the archives. Niall Harrington, by now a commandant, was appointed as the officer commanding at the Coast Watching Depot. And in 1940, O'Connell was detailed by the Chief of Staff to carry out a study of general defence plans, an important task and one indicative of O'Connell's competency and the regard within which his competency was held, but one which left him with only time to look after the archives in a supervisory capacity. And tragically, uh, Colonel J.J. O'Connell died in service in 1944. So from 1946 until 1953, while Harrington um, officially held the appointment of staff officer in the archive subsection, he was never actually physically employed in this role. In reality, Harrington worked as officer in charge of security subsection of Army Intelligence. In 1953, Harrington was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and served as the Assistant Director of Intelligence. But by this stage, the military archives had long become dormant. By 1959, the year of his retirement, the military archives was removed from the official establishment of the Army following the reorganisation of that year. But the military archives would have remained like this had it not been for this man, Commandant Peter Young. Peter was born in 1950 in Dublin and joined the 43rd Cadet Class in October 1968. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in 1970 and posted to the 12th Infantry Battalion in Clonmel, Tipperary. In 1976, Peter was posted to Combat Intelligence subsection of Army Intelligence. The same year, he undertook the Diploma in Archival Studies in UCD, the first officer to do so. In 1977, Peter wrote an article entitled Military Archives in the Defence Forces, which was published in the Defence Forces official publication on Cusentor. And this article was part of Peter's campaign for the re-establishment of the military archives. In 1978, Peter moved within intelligence to the press and publicity subsection. In 1981, Peter was promoted to commandant, and in 1982, thanks to his efforts, the military archives subsection was re-established as a subsection of army intelligence. Developing the military archives was a labour of love for Peter. Katrina Crow, who was a good friend of Peter's, described to me how it, it, the pinnacle of his ambition had been to be the director of the military archives. However, as it had been with the military archives in previous decades, not everyone comprehended its value. 
as one of Peter's commanding officers in particular, I found out in the course of research, um, there was one officer who couldn't see the wood for the trees and would comment regularly in Peter's annual reports that his professional and career development should, would benefit from a posting out of the military archives into an infantry battalion as a company commander. Peter was joined by Captain later Commandant Victor Lang, who was also his successor as officer in charge of the military archives, and continued to develop the military archives to the extent that by 1990, only four years after the publication of the National Archives of Ireland Act, the institution was designated as the official place of deposit for the archival records of the Defence Forces, Department of Defence and Army Pensions Board, which I mentioned earlier on in the uh, presentation. Now, among Peter's uh, many great achievements was his involvement, along with Katrina Crow of the National Archives, in securing the release into the public domain of the Bureau of Military History Witness Statements in 1999. These consisted of 1,773 witness statements taken between 1947 and 57 from individuals who had been active during the revolutionary period. Due to their sensitivity, they had been kept under lock and key in government buildings. Unfortunately, a week later, having secured their release to the public, Peter died. In this audio extract, uh, Katrina Crow describes the day they were called into the Taoiseach's department to receive the good news about the Bureau material and the tragic news she received a week later of Peter's death. Jason, so anyway, we went in at Leppard. We were told by the personnel in, of both departments that the records were going to be released forthwith and that Peter should start preparing to have them brought to the military archives. And we were thrilled. So we came out at 12 o'clock into the sunshine and we said, we better go and have a glass of whiskey because this is like a historic day. We went down to the Stevens Green Hotel and we had whiskey each, toast of Bureau of Military History, left, I had to go back to Bishop Street and him to go back to the military archives. And he turned around in the corner and blew me a kiss and that was the last time I saw him alive. He died. So we and it was, it broke my heart. He was 49 years old. He had so much to offer. He was on the verge of this fantastic breakthrough, which he would have so enjoyed and made oh, So anyway, we went in at 11. Now, several officers have had the privilege of filling the top position at the military archives since Peter. Victor Lang, Pori Kennedy, Stephen McGowan, Claire Mortimer and myself. But the military archives that we have now is the legacy of what was started by Peter Young. And it's because of this that the reading room is named in his honour with a plaque bearing the epithet, Father of the Military Archives, which is fitting. So this is the military archives itself that we have now since 2016. These are the plans for the new building that was opened in 2016. So if you can see the arrow on the screen, this model on the left is an overview of the complex. So this building here is a hospital block built in the 1840s, which was fully renovated. Downstairs is the common Peter Young reading room, the conservation lab, and then upstairs are our offices and administrative areas. And if you look at the side view here, this is the old hospital block. You can see the arrow on the screen there. The repository itself, which is these two gable, these two um, pitched roofs here, and here they are on the left-hand side of the, the blueprint, is a repository um, with holding 20, just over 21 linear kilometers of shelving where we keep our records. And then this small area here is the old guard room for the barracks. So the barrack museum and visitor center is in this area here. And just here we have a lecture room and meeting room, which means that we can engage in outreach activities and educa educational outreach as well um, within our small campus in the, in the corner of Cahalbrew Barracks. This is the development of the building itself. So what you're looking at now, the area to the foreground is the, there was nothing there. This is where the repository has been built. And the building in the background is the old hospital block. This is what was the common, this is, how the common Peter Young reading room was. You can see the condition it was very poor. And you can see as well here the stairs and the walls, the condition that it was in. And here we have a photograph of the archive itself. Now an archival repository, as we were taught in our professional archival education, should reflect the significance of the material it holds to the people and the state. And this is important because 
Coming to an archive can be a daunting thing for some people if they haven't used one before. It's not like a museum where you can just walk in. You need to make an appointment, and we're not an exhibition space, so you need to, to find out what you want to, to view and then make an appointment to view it. It can be doubly so, extra daunting, if you need to come through the gates of a barracks to do so. I think in terms of the design here, the architects got it spot on. So it's still very much the military archives, the new repository is in keeping with the design of the old building, and the buildings themselves are in keeping with Cattlebrewer Barracks, which itself dates back to the 1800s. However, the entrance area, which is a uh, glass front, which is, is open, and then you go in and there's a nice, um, all the inside is, is, is designed in wood. It's a welcoming space and a place that people feel welcome to come and that they're very comfortable researching. And this is important because the records that we have, we're the custodians, but they belong to the people of the Irish state. Access is a right. And I know again from speaking to Katrina Crow as well, she was on very much on the same wavelength as Peter when it came to archival policy, that it was about three things, access, access, access. So I think we have achieved that in the design of the building, in its symbolism and in its usability. And this is the building itself. Our current facility, open in 2016, is a fitting tribute not only to Peter, but to all of the officers, NCOs, privates, civilian staff, civil servants, academics, donors, and numerous other supporters who have contributed to making the military archives what it is today and continues to become. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Daniel. A really fascinating overview. And, and I think really interesting to hear the fight that, that uh, was made by several people over mm. the, the decades to preserve this archive and often how hard it is to see how important our history is when we're living through it. And I think it was very interesting, you were talking about the, the sort of 10 to 15 year period after the, the War of Independence and the mm. treaty and how difficult it was for people to share their stories. I'm just wondering about civilians who access the, the archive at the moment, um, like I presume, you, as you say, you make an appointment. What kind of materials do people typically look for? Is it personal information about their families? Is it local history research? What, what kind of um, information are civilians looking for? The material that people um, look for at the military archives is extremely varied. I mean, genealogy is a big thing because the army by its nature keeps very detailed personal records. So we do have um, a lot of personal records from officers and from um, enlisted soldiers. So people who are doing uh, family history research will come to us to view very often their, their fathers or grandfathers and or, or not as much mother's file because of the makeup of the army back in the 20s and 30s. But um, we do have an ethical policy whereby we only make records available to next of kin. Um, we can retain personal data under the GDPR um, for archival purposes, and we will make it available to the people who are still living if um, they wish to do so, to view their personal file. But I think it's an ethical thing that we, we only make personal files available to, to next of kin. In terms of people doing family history research, we also have the, the 1922 Army Census, which is a great document for people who had somebody serving in the National Army at the beginning. So this was taken on the night of, of the 12th and 13th of November 1922, and it documents um, everybody who was a member of the National Army at that time, and that's fully digitized and available on our website. Um, again, the question of what kind of material do people access? Coming up to anniversaries, they look increasingly for material to do with that anniversary, so we've had a lot of requests for Civil War material recently. Um, previously, we would have had material relating to 1916 and um, the War of Independence. We also have a lot of information available online. The Bureau of Military History is all digitized and available online, and the Bureau of Mi the, the Military Service Pensions Collection is being digitized. There are several thousand records online and thousands more to come. So we do have a lot available online as well. Then other things people look for, it can be as mundane as somebody who's interested in military vehicles, looking for mechanical blueprints for a vehicle from the 1950s, right down to you know, somebody doing some sensitive research, maybe to do with a crime or a historical crime, and they want to see aerial photographs of an area of the country taken by the Air Corps in the 50s or the 60s. So it really is, how long is a piece of string? It's yeah, very broad. Quite varied. Um, you kind of answered part of my next question, which is just about online access, because obviously at the moment uh, we have limited mm -hmm. access to cultural institutions. So if people were to look on your website, what kind of information would they find there? The website has um, 
a lot of digitized collections available. That's the bulk of the information on the website. There's also a news feed and um, some educational resources as well. But for people who want to conduct research specifically, we have two types of collections online. So we have fully digitized collections where the finding aid is available and the original document is, can be viewed digitally online. And then we have um, where we just have the finding aid online, but the material hasn't been digitized. So a lot of the material we have digitized, as I mentioned, the, the big stuff is the Bureau of Military History, the Military Service Pensions Collection. Um, we have ac extracts from our oral history project up there. We have log books from lookout posts during the emergency. I think we have Civil War, um, I think we have Civil War internment roles digitized. Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of, of stuff on there. Brilliant, really looking forward to having a look through the archive like that. And thank you very much uh, for being here this evening and for being part of this talk series. Um, it's been a real pleasure to have members of the Defence Forces here at the um, St. Thomas's Curtis Union Learning Centre in Butler Gallery to accompany Amelia Steen's exhibition, which was due to close on Sunday. So with the closure under level uh, three restrictions this week, it's, it's a few days early, mm. but uh, thankfully we've had it here for, for um, a number of weeks and have had great attendance and great interest locally. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot.